TV. Peace, world, and wreck for M Wreck TV. I got a special guest in the building. My brother, could you please let the people know who you be? I know who you be, but just let them know, just in case. You already know this DJ Jelly, the stand up crew, A Town Icon. You already know. Facts. Facts. Like he said, A Town Icon. Atlanta GA. Salute, salute, my brother. So, how did you come with the name DJ Jelly? Where that come from, fam? Man, that's that's just you know, my, you know, when Cool J came out with Jelly Bean, that was just something that was easy to use on the cut. And man, that's you know, that, there it is. Right, you know, I was in St. Louis High School mm. using that, cutting that gotcha. up. Mm -hmm. gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Now, um. Let me ask you something, because you know a lot of people got the DJ name in front of their name, but they don't really DJ. Right. Um, you've been doing this a long time. Yeah. So you came from the era where you had to really DJ mix, blend, cuts, and all that. So do you still do that in your set? Yeah, I still, yeah, of course. That ain't going nowhere. That's you know, that's in my DNA. So of course. Cool. You know, you know, you know that's that's the beauty of the art form. You know, this is part of hip hop, period. It's just the art form. I, you know, you know, I, I'm i not one of them old heads that was like, one, where I didn't want to mess with technology. You know, yeah, it took me a little time. And two, I didn't get technology and say, well, you know, I'm on cruise control. I'm good. I didn't get all off into that. I still yeah. like to sweat, work out when I'm DJing. Love it. It's, it's, it's therapeutic. Yes, period. sir. Yeah. Yes, yes sir. Now, with a town like ATL, I, I would say you was down there before ATL was really big on the scene. Right. Um, Explain to me or give people a picture of you being down there early before anybody was jacking Atlanta. Like, what the scene was back then when you first was I mean, the scene, to, the scene was what everybody had gotten excited about over the decades to be. It was people party here. It was easy going. There were a lot of trees. It wasn't as much construction. Um, and it's still not much compared to New York, but mm -hmm. everybody party. Um, the music was different. The strip club scene was really cracking. The strip club mm -hmm. scene was, that's where, that was the radio of Atlanta. That was the streets. Came to the strip club. That was the, the the golf where people play golf. That's what they did in Atlanta. All the street folk came to the strip. Mm. Club. You heard all the music, you saw all the beautiful women. People spent a lot of money, so it was just it was festive in that. It was that real culture then. It was strictly based on that street and that stripping culture, and all the music came right through that. All the fashion. You that was that was really our radio at that time. Because hip hop radio wasn't big in the early mm -hmm. 90s. Facts. Now, I would say Atlanta definitely opened up the strip club scene. Like, just because now, well, before the corona hit, New York was on that for the last, I say, six or seven years. But Atlanta been on that type of vibe, whereas the records was being broken in the strip club. Mm -hmm. Like, if you was popping in the town you had to be popping in the strip clubs you know absolutely. What I'm saying? absolutely um being that the, the the covid hit hard hit everybody the world and being that atlanta i want to say whole scene was based upon the strip club so what's going on right now currently well i mean i think in the last i, I think in the last six seven years the strip club scene is is still important, but the last six, seven years, it kind of got broken up because then radio became so dominant in Atlanta, in this market, mm. and of course, internet. Mm -hmm. So now you got these outlets. Before, back in the day, we just didn't have all that going on. Facts. You know, we just didn't have it. So we relied strictly, that's where we were. We were in the clubs to see what was going on, and we had events like Free Nick and Jack the Rapper, which bought all the music culture along, combined it with Atlanta's music culture. Right. So it's, right. just, it's just wide open. So the COVID thing, yeah, as far as the, 
the extracurricular activities out in the streets. Yeah, but mm-hmm. musically it hasn't stopped anything because everything is is really a test market here in terms of you got studios everywhere in Atlanta now. Everywhere. And everybody come here to vibe from all around the world now. So we, you know, the strip club scene isn't as prominent in the decisions of the music anymore. Got you. Got you. Now it's important, but it hasn't dominant as it was what it was. Got you. I want to ask you about your relationships. Like, let's let's talk about the Dungeon family. Like, how did you link with them? I mean, Dungeon family. They basically, you know, early nineties uh, when you know me and MC Assault. That's who I started the mixtape uh, stuff with. We were cracking er- in the early nineties, so. You know, I, I came across like Dre and them um, in the flea market because the swap mm. meet, people call swap meets or whatever. We, they came across me one time. It was like, hey, man, we want you to go on tour with us. And at the time, in the early 90s, I was basically like, man, we're going to start this new label, which was Big Room Records. Mm. I was like, man, I, I wouldn't mind getting down with you, but I can't because that's where my time was to. And I was straight up. And gotcha. we started the mixtape team. We were running. The streets as far as the music also because of the mixtape. Radio, radio wasn't dominant, but we were. We basically put out the music that was to the other streets. So I got I kind of met Dre through through that. But then early on, in mid nineties, when Hot came, the hip hop radio station, mm-hmm. I got a job there. And at the same time, I ended up becoming the tour first tour DJ for Goody Mob. So that's wow. when the relationship really started in the early 90s, 95, really started coming in. But let me roll back a little bit to 93 when I was on V103. I had a mix mm-hmm. show and I started breaking a lot of the outcast music. Mm-hmm. I was one of the first DJs to really start playing on a large scale. Mm-hmm. So back then, you know, it was, it was all about Dr. Dre and all them. I started really playing outcast, all the outcast music. So ninety five, I got with the Goody Mob and went on tour with them for a year. Wow, so that's how I started really getting down, going to the dungeon, Rico basement, listening to the music, and and just really saying, wow, how incredible this is you know, like being a fly on the wall. Basically, that's what I was because we had the own count, but you know, I was kicking it with the Dungeon family just with through the Goody Mob movement. Gotcha, so gotcha. Got you know. And then, of course, I was always breaking the music when I got the hot. Dre and Gip bought me elevators, like mm-hmm. Jelly Roll played it. And this it's like Monster Record. Yeah, I forgot which weekend it was a Memorial Day weekend or something. And I was just playing it back to back in the mix. Mm-hmm. I almost got fired. LA Reed called up to the program director was like, What is he playing? Why is he playing? Because it? it wasn't what? supposed to be they gave me a test press. And it wasn't supposed to be played. And this is L.A. Reid before he was at um, Def Jam. This is L.A. Reid when he yeah, was at yeah, this, this L.A. Reid, LaFace Records, which was one of the major, first major labels during this hip-hop era in the 90s that just dominated. And he was hot because, you know, they wasn't supposed to put out the music yet because they yeah. trying to put the marketing in and, you know, how they going to plan the record release. Mm-hmm. The, you know, Gip and, and Dre just came, 3,000 came was like, yeah, we need to play it. I was mm-hmm. like, no. You know, so not, LA Reed called up the uh, program director. He was like, "Man, get his." Is he doing? Wow! Program director had my back. Shout out to Steve Hegwood. Uh-huh. He had my back. So there it is. You know what I'm saying? I just kept. I played it, man, back to back. I was on probably at four. I played it like thirty minutes. Here. I went played thirty minutes there. I just kept just rolling. It was different, but wow. it was. It was cool though. I was like, man, this is wow. Yo, that was a huge record too. Huge record. This is before it, this is before Luda played in any of them. Because you know Luda had his own show, him and Poon Daddy. And they get the credit, but I was really banging it hard. Mm. So it was well, let me ask you this, being that you brought up um Ludacris, mm-hmm. and this is Ludacris, the radio Chris personality. Love love, Chris Love and Love it in. Yeah, Rex Chris Love and Love it, the radio personality. Yeah. What was your relationship with him during that time? Oh man, me and Chris, that was my dog. I mean, he would come to the house with his first album. We used to just sit in my house. He'd just play all the cuts for me. 
You know, he was, wow. he was cool, not like Big Bro. You know, he was doing his thing, you know, as a personality. And, um, man, we was all tight doing that family. Poon Daddy, DJ Nabs. Mm. Like, oh, it was a, a, a real tight family because everybody was coming up together. We didn't know where everything was going. Everybody was mm. trying to come. Whether it was a dungeon family, whether it was the Oom camp, whoever. You know, it's mm. like everybody was just trying stuff. Like, man, we just going to do this. Facts. Yeah, me and Chris I always been, even when he blew up all that, like, he's, he all chop it up, mm. come to his crib, whatever, he lay a verse for a mixtape for me, whatever. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Salute. Damn. Salute. Salute. That's one thing about um, ATL. Y'all really lock in with each other. Y'all y'all was, like, one of the first, um, I want to say, uh, 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 I guess, towns or regions to do that. Like, y'all really stuck together and everybody popped you know? yeah everybody yeah everybody every, yeah everybody really supported each other you know you're yeah. gonna you're gonna have some of the hating crews of course of but course. you know but, hey, for the man, most part man. for the most part yeah yeah you're gonna have that element but everybody for the most part really stayed down with each other gotcha. and, you know what i'm saying gotcha. and um, mm -hmm. i read and i'm um, not to cut your wisdom but i read in your on um, one sheet when um I guess Outkast uh, gave you the first single, Southern Playalistic. Yeah, you really wasn't feeling that at first. Next, explain that. They didn't give it to me. I heard okay. it. I actually heard it on the. Um, I heard it on this this Christmas, LaFace Christmas album, and I mm. saw the picture and I'm like, that looked kind of, that looked kind of corny. <laughs> When I heard the music, I was like, oh, whatever. I heard the news, I was like, cool. I was like, uh -huh. that, that didn't really interest me. But then a couple of weeks later, fast forward to then, I'm at Club Nicky's, which one of the top strip clubs in that time. And they and they put the video on, on the big screen. Uh -huh. We saw Dre with the, with the Braves jersey rapping and spitting. I'm like, I just sat there and froze like, man, this is the same damn song? You know, it just changes the perspective. You know, the video, yeah. sometimes that yeah, happens. Im Im image and performance is everything. You think man, what I'm everything, man. And, and even the younger artists, not, you got to understand that. That's the presentation. You got to have yes. it. Yes. Yeah, that, yes. Changed, that changed me up ASAP. I was just like, okay, let's go. But off the rip, you just thought the whole thing was corny. Like, I don't know, off the rip. I'm and not even I like, salute you for keeping it real because most right. people will be like, yo, yeah, that's in my one sheet, but I ain't trying to say that on your platform. You did? Right, right, right. But it's just, you know, you got to be honest. But, you mm -hmm. know, I fell in love with their movement and I became one of their biggest supporters in Chile. It, that's it, a fact. It is what it is. I respect what they did. And, and how so, crazy is that, you know, and I hate to say the word because I'm not trying to throw them away because I think they're the one of the best groups and, and Andre 3000 is one of the best lyricists ever in the game. I feel like, you know, when you said, oh, I think this is corny, and then now fast forward, of course, to 2020. Right. Outcast is one of the biggest and probably one of the illest groups that ever came out of hip-hop. Ever. And, 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 and Andre 3000 is this revered lyricist it's like when you look back at it, would you would you ever think that in 2020 that people will be looking at them at this? Hell, you know, at no, that no, I, no, I already I knew something was special. Uh -huh. Like we didn't we didn't know. I mean, you know, you just didn't know. I didn't yeah. know. You know, I'm, we are here doing stuff, and and really as a DJ, my position was basically like, man, folks got to hear this. People coming here for free, Nick. I got to put on the tape. If I'm traveling up north, I gotta play. If I'm at the radio, I gotta play. I just felt that in my blood, and that's how I felt about the whole Atlanta movie. Got you. Now, Outcast is this big group. Um, you with the Dungeon family, you know, that's your family. Um, Goody Marvis rolling. Yeah. And they got this this movement, this wave, I wanna say, like. I think everything that was coming out, the Dungeon family was like going, and then you were yeah, they was the main. Yeah, they was kill. They was killing it at the time. You were like the main DJ that was breaking the records. You was the go-to DJ, so you had like this power in Atlanta because, of course, they like these big, you know, artists from the town, 
but you could get all the exclusives. I know a lot of DJs probably was, you know, I wouldn't say hating, but maybe they was feeling the way or, or feel like, damn, you're, you're giving everything to DJ Jelly. Did you go through some of that? I mean, I'm pretty sure ain't nobody said nothing to me because, I mean, I, I roll with the crew. Mm -hmm. You know, big old, you know, known from the streets. I mean, we rolled deep. Mm -hmm. I'm from the west side, so mm -hmm. I didn't really never really had to deal with nothing crazy. You know, I'm I'm sure with people that was hating, but you know, I would you know, I, I uh, treat people with respect, so I ain't never got all into that. You know, I would know if somebody says somebody I knew it anyway, you know, and keep it moving. Gotcha, gotcha. But I ain't never really had to deal with no drama like that, you know, with, mm -hmm. with the big haters like that. You know. But it was cool though, because um I mean, it was a couple, it was like me and a couple of street DJs that were just on that. A lot of mm -hmm. known DJ to this day wasn't really pumping outcasts like that. You know, but they'll say it now, but they really mm. wasn't pumping it back then. Wow. Wow. All right. Yeah, take me back there when you was just breaking these outcast records, and I guess you was reaching out to other DJs, and you'd be like, yo, you know, I need you to jump on this record. So, what was they like response? Was they saying like straight no or they uh I guess try to curb you or like what was the vibe like when you first was trying to break outcast records? I mean they they wasn't trying to curb me, they were just like, Yeah, yeah. You know, we'll get to it, you know what I'm saying? Of course the real big records, a lot of DJs eventually start playing, but I think mm -hmm. in Georgia Couple of, a lot of, of, of the street DJs were the radio DJs wasn't on it, so that was a good thing because they our character was young family supported by the streets, and then you know Alabama, top of Florida, West Coast was on it, was on the records mm. in terms of like the radio DJs and the street DJs. Facts. Now took a little, you know, just took a little time. Got you. Now, when Outkast first came out, you know, they was really, you know, about them bars. You know, still right. is. Well, yeah, yeah, they, they always been about bars. Now, yeah. look, Andre, Dre became Andre 3000 and became this whole different type of artist. So, like, what, what year was that? I mean, if you said you said more like the by the second album, Dre really been who he is even from the beginning. Mm. You, know, the, you have to understand it. he's always been that. Gotcha. Always been different. Always, you know, been you know artistic. Outcasts have been outcasts. It's just that the public had to catch up. That's gotcha. how it was. The public. Gotcha. Uh, gotcha. They always been like that. No, because like you said early on. They had the um, what was it? The baseball jerseys. Yeah. Then the, by the second album, he started changing up the look. What he did, his look. Exactly. That's what I'm he talking about. The look up. Still the same way he raps now. He's mm -hmm. getting tighter and tighter, but he just got him. Got yeah. you. Got you. Did you see? Did you see the vision when he changed up the look, or you was like, I don't know, he might be going a little. No, I did. Back. I did. I just I felt it. I didn't okay. see it. And I felt it. I was like, okay. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Got gotcha. you. Got gotcha. you. And they hope the whole click was always, you know, think about Rico and Ray and Pat, all of them, man. They always been artistic, they've been impressive, and they've always mm -hmm. um been consistent in terms of creativity. Like that was the, the most important thing they wanted to show the world, and they did that. You know that collectively. Yeah. Facts, because I feel like um Dre and CeeLo, they got bars, you know, like out out this world. But at any given time, they will just hit you with a whole singing record or or just a whole different type of record that that could be in like fifty different markets. You know right. what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. They they you know well you know they. Artists that they use their vocals. I was listening to Black Thought this morning on uh, Sway. Like he said, he said, "Now I use my vocals. Mm -hmm. Whatever, it, whatever the record calls for, that's how I'm gonna do it. Whether it's singing, bars, mm -hmm. whatever. That's, that's what they do." Gotcha. Gotcha. Now I gotta, I gotta ask you this though, 
being a DJ, you're like the medium between the artists, the record labels, and the people. Right? right. Now, of course, you're playing your radio records, you're playing your uh, you know, your club records, right, so forth and so on. But now you got certain artists that don't get along, and now they got their disc records, or they might even have a big radio record, but they throw with shots. So now, how do you, I guess, play these records without getting get caught up in the middle of the beef or whatever? Like, I know you've been in situations where you had to, it was like a gray area. I need you to go into some of those backstories, if you Man, I, I mean, one right off the rip, one, um, one major one, um, and this is for definitely for Atlanta folks that really understand Atlanta music. Mm -hmm. um, artist Kilo Ali, is, who is like, and Sammy Sam. Sammy Sam is like a DMX or a cool G rap. All right, mm -hmm. Atlanta, real rugged, rough, hood. Kilo, hood artist that did all the like we talk about three thousand and Kilo. He sings and everything. They were artists that ran like, the early part of the nineties. They ran it like if you talk about wow. great, everybody know about Hitman Sammy Sam. And Kilo Ali, period. Gotcha. He actually respected. Like they were the first ones that I got in. You know, like Sam really kicked out the Big Room Records label. Big Room signed Sammy Sam. So he was like the, the real hood street for real with it artist. Gotcha. So Kilo, who I you know respected musically, he was he was like Drake, but he was still hood. Gotcha. They was going back and forth, and I would be at a spot the five five nine. Which is equivalent to the club is equivalent to the Palladium in New York. Back mm, wow! It was the hood. It was where everybody came to the hood mm -hmm. spot. And I used to throw birthday parties, and I had both of them perform. So you know they would, you know, so yeah. So wow. I would always, you know, me. I'm always I'm gonna be a mediator. I ain't gonna just jump to one. So even though we just signed Sam, you know, I just knew that both of them were very important in the culture of the music. So I would always, you know, we wouldn't, we'd keep, I'd be like, look, y'all come to my party, don't come. You know, y'all be on this side, you can go over this way, and you need, Sam, you and your folks be on this side with my people. Gotcha. You know what I'm saying? I would just let them know off the rip, even before they would come. And then fast forward and that, you had somebody like T.I., who I know since he was a kid, because he's like 14. And uh, your boy and Lil Flip. I was gonna get into all that. Hey, since you brought it up, let's go there. When they went out, man, because when Flip first started coming to Atlanta, man, he would come and kick with me and Big Loop all the time. Mm -hmm. Come through, like the most seven, come to the studio, work, get on records, all that. And then the whole T.I. thing started happening. And then, man, Flip started stop taking my calls. He stopped, you know, at, yeah. He got crazy. We coming in town, we wouldn't even know. He the next day we found out he was in town. Like it got ugly, man. Damn. And you know, it was getting ugly. I'm talking about and you know, I even I'm like, man, you know, we still cool, it ain't all about that. He you know, certain artists, if they're not from your place, then I get it. They not gonna just be hanging like that because Pip started turning up the heat on them real fast, especially when he had Starface call in and I was like, man, Damn. ugly bro, it just got ugly. Well, I'm still out the loop. How did they beef start? Like T.I. and Little Flip. What What is it all about? Man, I I don't know, man. It, had, it probably had to do with the line. I'm not going to lie to you. But speaking of Tip, let me go to another beef with Tip and Lou. Yeah, go into that. Now, this was crazy. Tip, I was doing the mixtape, and Tip, Said, just let him go ahead and lay a verse on the mixtape. Okay. So I, laid, so I let him go ahead and do his thing. And I was on hot at the time. And I DJ. This was like towards, this was like in the 2000s or whatever. Uh -huh. and I did a mix. I was as a guest DJ then. And I played the verse. And Tip just snapped. I mean, he had snapped on Luda. I was like, wow. whoa. I played it anyway because he was uh -huh. hot. Uh -huh. you know, it was really, you know, this 2002. Three. Mm. It was hot, you know, coming out, coming out the box. And of course, yeah, T.I. was on fire at that time. Jaka and Lula obviously caught a little whip of the man, and it started, I mean, I heard it started getting bad, because they started catching, 
running the folks at the club amongst each other. They heard these verses. They was like, this ain't wow. what But, you know, wow. he stood his ground. You know what I mean? He stood his ground. Wow. He both of my boys. You know, now, you know that as, is a D, as a DJ, right? Mm -hmm. You kind of caught in the middle by the fourth. Well, right. Regardless of what, like you said, both of them your boys, but you in the middle. Yeah, and I and I let and I will let each one, each artist know. Look, I will take the music. This ain't mm how -hmm. you know. Ain't nobody say, well, don't play his song and don't play that song. Them kind of situation artists, a lot of them from Gucci Man, a lot of them. I would just let they let them and their people know. Like, look, I'm a DJ. I play mm -hmm. for the people, and they will get caught up in what y'all do. Facts. Like just, I just let them know off the rip, just off the rip. Either they you jelly or okay, whatever. Keep it rolling. Mm. Now I gotta ask you this: You getting them records, the mixtape freestyles, and you know we in this. I want to say this versus stage. You know, um, shouts to Swiss and Timberland. Oh yeah, everybody that's doing the verses. I was doing the verses four years ago on my own platform, and that's no, another story. But salute to them. I ain't no hater. Salute to them, right? You getting these verses from Ti and, and Luda? You knowing them personally, so you you can hear the shots that other people can't catch. Who would you say got the best of who? Like just just keeping it real, just being a fan of of hip hop, and and outside of yeah, those both your peoples. We just got to just call it here's, what it is. Here's, here's something interesting to me. I think from from a gut and the soul feeling, I like T.I. stuff. Okay. His, his shots. Mm -hmm. I think, me personally, I think lyrically, Luda's a better rapper. Mm. I'm not saying by this and that, but mm -hmm. I think lyrically, but tip vibe in his and his hungriness, especially at that time, spoke more to me than anything. Mm. And I felt, I felt it more. God, you me. might have lyrics that are tighter, but if you, the fit still, go back to presentation, vibe and feel, he just, he just own it. Yeah, yeah, now T.I. I would say is more so of a vibe. He can rap too, he's lyrically dope. No, he, he lyric, he's tight, he's tight. Now he's tight, but then, if you go off the technical aspect of ludicrous metaphor, symbolies, flows, Luda is a different kind of animal. Like he's right, you know, he's definitely right. in the elite when it comes to right. that. So I Absolutely. understand you saying that. I agree with you because I, yeah. I was gonna keep it real with you. If you didn't, if you ain't if you ain't call it how you just called it, I was gonna say, nah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm gonna tell you Luda a little bit more nicer than T.I. Lyric. Yeah, but yeah. Like you said, in terms of the music that you felt and the vibe, I'm, I, I'll go with T.I. Yeah, T.I. had the street. Definitely. Definitely, definitely. And then um, it was a record, I want to say. And this guy, he's he's on his funny style tip, too. I hate to give him wave, but it is what it is. Your man, Young Buck, he had a record. I think he put T.I. And, and Ludacris on it, right? What yeah. Yeah, I'm knowing. Um, man, I'm... But I forgot all about that record, but yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. you sure did. And, and then they didn't even know it. They just did it. They just put it together. I think that was more of a genuine the move. You know, 50, man. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, bro. Come on. It was a genuine marketing move? Got you. It worked, it, though. It added fuel to that fire, though. Yo, it, yo, now, take me back to that time, that era, when that record came out. T.I.'s popping, Young Buck with G on it popping, Ludacris is popping. What did that record do to the town and to the streets? It was, it was, it was making people feel that they had to take sides at mm. that time. Like seriously, straight down, like the, you had the industry, the street, everybody was confused. You know, people was like, well, every, a lot of people, a lot of people at that time was taking sides, but it wasn't nothing like was long lasting. It wasn't like a, um, like a, a meat meals or a great situation, but you know, mm -hmm. it was a temporary thing that people really started splitting up at that time. Got you. And it, it, it didn't get too crazy, which was a good thing. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? 
I don't know how. To, I really don't remember how the the beef got squashed. I know they ended up come out with records, obviously. But um, yeah, that was a good thing. They didn't really last. The beef didn't last enough to really, you know, have people where they was the west side against the south side and all that kind of stuff. Got you. I'm gonna ask you one more question about the Ti Luda thing or beef, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, where did that come from? Why um, was it Ti? Because you said Ti jumped on, I, I guess, uh, a freestyle mixtape and started going at Luda. Was that? Yeah, I think that, that was that was kind of I caught them at whatever had happened previous to that. I caught them after that because he was like, "Just let me want to lay this right quick." I'm like, mm -hmm. "All right." You know what I'm saying? So he just got used that vehicle. He just got like, I'm just going to give it to him. So the previous stuff that happened, I don't know if it was a girl or whatever. I don't know. They're going to have to tell you that one. Gotcha. Um, and nine times out of ten is always a female. <laughs> Facts. You, yo, you keep it official, Jelly. Salute. Nine times out of ten, it's always a female. Now, okay. Speaking of T.I., he recently called out 50 Cent. You know, for the verses. I know you saw that, right? Of course. If you had to pick between the two, who would you think would win in the verses between T.I. and 50 Cent? Oh, man. That, that's that's a that's a tough one, man. I'm, I'm still trying to figure that one. That's a tough one. I, um, you know, 50 first album is incredible. That's the classic. Hip-hop of ever. You know, that's that's the edge he has on tilt. That Kid oh, Richard Die Trying is a monster. Tip has some big records. Yes. But 50, he might have the edge on Tip on that one. That one would be a good. That would be a good one I want to see, though. Mm. I yeah, see. I, would like, I would love to I see that as well. See. But you know what's so crazy? You, you're not the first to say that. It's people who said, because of Get Rich or Die Trying, 50 got the edge or, you know, because, you know, T.I. do got. A crazy catalog and some crazy catalog. big records crazy catalog. and some monster records. Monster, monster records. records. Absolutely. Hands down. Hands down. But that Get Rich, oh my goodness, bro. Come yes. on, that's one of the best albums made in the last, what, 25 years? Or yeah, when that joint dropped, it was it was crazy. But in 2020, though, and, and me being a realist, and I know you're a realist, did a lot of those records age well? Because a lot of those, if you listen to the album now, could you play it all the way through like you played it back in 2003? <sighs> no. Mm. Could I play a lot of the records? Yeah. I could. I could play a lot yeah. of records. Not like then, no. Of course not. Not like then. You know, yeah, yeah. Like, you know a, a album um, that I would definitely like, Jeezy's album. Jeezy's monster album, I would definitely Rock still like what? Like, which album are you talking about from Jeezy? Um, uh, Jeezy, I'm um, where am I? Damn, Trapper, was it Trapper Die? No, that's the yeah, Trapper Die, Trapper Die. Okay, that Trapper album, died. the first one, like Trapper Die, Trapper Die, Value One, Thug Motivation, Thug Motivation. There you go, that Thug was crazy. Motivation. The first one, yeah, I heard that just like I did then. Especially in the last, especially in the South, <laughs> anywhere in the South, okay, just like Yo, I when, when Jeezy came out, let's let's go there. He had a crazy wave. That that snowman wave, that joint was different because I never seen nobody sell. Because you got to think the snowman, it, it was like it wasn't like a cra crazy design. It was just like a snowman on the shirt, and them joints was moving like. Crack and right, you gotta, yeah, you gotta understand though, he was an extension of that whole BMF era. Going to it, you know, he was like the vocal. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, that was an era that swept across the country. Fact. He was a soundtrack, you know, <clears throat> he was a soundtrack of BMF. You know, that era in that time, right in that bubble, it was a rap. He killed it, period. Yep. I like the way you put that. He was the soundtrack to BMF life and they lifestyle. He was, a, he was an extension of it. Maybe not literally, but he was an extension of it. Facts. Incredible Facts. time period, too. That was really one of the last moments to me in as far as when people think about coming to Atlanta and, and the excitement and the strip club culture. That was kind of 
to me, like the last era of that, of what people perceive as what Atlanta mm. is from the fantasies that they heard over those decades from the early 90s to then. That was like the last era. Straight so up. Same. BMF. Era was kind era. of. Crazy. Wow. Up, up wow. The, the type of intensity and the excitement that Atlanta's known for. It's still exciting. It, but, it, yep, you know, from from that era on back, it was, I can't even explain it. You had to be there. Well, no, well, well we're going to get into it because it's a lot of dudes, right, that I, that I interviewed or spoke on a BMF situation. They said it was just different. When BMF came to the club, it was like, all the bottles got bought out. The chicks flocked to them. Because it was like, they was bigger than the rappers. You know, they was... Absolutely. You know, they were street hustlers, and they had rappers in their can. But when they came to the club, they shut the joint down. Like, could you explain, like, maybe certain instances you saw that happen? Like, you know, a club? Give me a vision of that. Man, I... I, I mean, shouts out to Big Meats, you know, mm -hmm. ooh, all of them. Um... I mean, it was it was like a it was like a uh, a big tractor trailer coming through and shutting down the highway, and everybody just got to sit there in their cars and wait. Wow, that's what it was. Just it, that it was that type of impact. They were that ridiculous, you know what I'm saying? And, and I mean, it was and it was when you talk about making it rain, you definitely associate that with them. We think yeah, of that term came from them. That term. Make it rain came from being big meat. All that, all that was real. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna get too much in details because it, yeah, yeah, no, it was just a, it was just an era that was incredible. You had to be there to witness it. You know? Got you. Got you. Then you have to look at the documentary. Facts, facts, definitely. Now I want to ask you this about BMF because they did have artists in a faction, and they was. You know doing business like i would say they was doing good business you know what i'm saying they, you know they had the big billboards in atlanta and all that you know what was that vibe like because they was independent they, they wasn't signed to no majors or nothing like that but they had more billboards than artists that were signed to majors explain right. that. I, mean, I mean it's just a situation where you saw like people had money you know mm -hmm. they had money but to me out of all of that Jeezy stood out. The music was put together well. Shouts out to Charlie Red, um, Tyler yeah. Park, all of, all the producers of the album. Wow, and he captured that era perfectly. Facts, facts. Now, so all the artists that came up had Jeezy stood out and really put it down. Definitely, I'm gonna salute that. Now, speaking on Jeezy and you being a DJ. You had Gucci, and you know the what, what was the record they was both on? The So Icy record. So Icy record, classic. Classic. Now, the rumors is the record started taking off. I guess in Atlanta first. Yeah. Was you the first DJ to break that record? I was one of them. Okay. One of them, absolutely. Okay. So now you getting that record? I, 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 like you said, you was one of them. How fast did that record take off when you, I guess you started breaking it and all the other DJs started playing it? Man, it just spread it because it is it, it spoke to what was what's happening. That's a Atlanta lifestyle mm. and and the vibe and Gucci was the man, you know what I'm saying? You know, coming into that, you know, it's it spoke everything. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't a record that took uh, two years, like uh say like a lock it out, like what we put out with DJ mm -hmm. Owen. It just, it really moved in the months. It really was going. I'm glad you mentioned that. You see, mm -hmm. you see how you said that record took two years? For two years, a lot, yeah. a lot of dudes don't know that a lot of records took years to really break in the mainstream and, and just yeah. in the general public. That's the hustle. And, it, and, it, and there's no, and there's no, there's no one way to do it. And it mm -hmm. is no time period. It's on you. Facts. Facts. Now, getting back to that record, Jeezy was featured on that record, right? It was Gucci, yep. record, right? Yeah. I heard it was a situation, and this is the rumors in the streets and in the industry, that 
Jeezy had got the deal with, I guess, Def Jam at the time. And the record comes out, but Jeezy, I guess, wanted to put it on his album and, and, and use it as a single. And that's where the friction, you know, I guess, started from. Yeah, and I don't know what the conversation was between them. But yeah. Wow. You know? Because, you know, Jeezy a business dude. He going to, you know, try to finesse it and make stuff happen. Of course. He own it. As and he should. As, as he, he should. should. As he should. And Gucci is all about his brand. And I respect that, too. Gucci don't care about his brand. You know? Facts. So, Facts. You, know, you know, that, that situation, that got ugly. I don't want to yeah. get into that. You know, that's... But you know what? I'm glad we got past all that because... Yeah, definitely. Both of them really took Atlanta hip hop and Southern hip hop to another level. Now, you know, I don't want to get into the beef cause it got real with them. Yeah. It got really real. I'm just talking about the competitive nature of them being two rap artists from the South. And now, okay, we got this versus thing going on and I'm just throwing this in the air. Jeezy versus Gucci. You don't think that'd be a dope versus? Man, bro, come on. You. They, I can't even, no brainer, no brainer. That'd right. be a real tight one. That'd be super tight. In fact, Tim, if you're hearing us right now, we need to make that happen. Fact. That'd be a real Gigi tight versus one. Gucci. That'd be an incredible one, bro. Period. Crazy. Crazy. Now, do you got a dog in that fight? <laughs> that That's a tough one right there, bro. <laughs> That's a tough one right there. Mm -hmm. I ain't even lie. I can't say we're going to edge out. That's a, that's a, that's, woo. I don't know. It might end up being the drop. I don't know. That's a tough mm -hmm. one. I can't call that. I don't have an opinion on that. Got you. Bro. That's, a, that's a real tough one, bro. Now, okay, let's do this. You see, the same way you broke down the Luda in, in a T.I. situation, when you was like, T.I. is more like a vibe. He had the streets, and Luda is more lyrical. Yeah. Break down the Gucci and the Jeezy, you know, whole thing. Break that down. I mean, you got you got two gentlemen that got crazy street perspective mm -hmm. and are intact with their brand. And their brand is like shape a generation of people. Both Fact. people at the same time, baby. Fact. So it's like you got two, you got two tight, you got twin titans mm -hmm. to me that speak that you know. It's, 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 you know, if they was a rap group, if they was a rap duo, they would be the the new in terms of outcast for for the generation of that time period of mm. that street, of that street gutter trap period. Facts, straight up. That's a hard one right there, bro. You gonna have when we get up with Carl, really gonna be thinking about that. That's a hard one. Well, that's my that's job. A too. That's my that's a real deal. That's my job as an uh, MC slash interviewer is to stump you. Cause I mean, my thing is I gotta challenge you. Right. So now when you get off this interview, you'll be like, you know what? And that Jeezy and Gucci thing. I mean, thinking now, you like right now you in, you enjoy. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 So, now, moving on, Atlanta, I would say, um, controlled the rap scene. Still is, in a sense. Quiet. I would say, we, we going on like, what, 20 years now? Yeah. Like, Probably the longest in the game. Yeah. That Atlanta Ooh. run is crazy. Still running. Still, Still running. running. Still running. And then you witness, let's say, you had, um, um, Titty Boy. He was a part of what was the group name again? Um uh Disturbing the Peace. Ludus. Yeah, no, that's that was the label, but he was a part uh because his partner name was Dollars. Right? Oh, you took a part with Dollar. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Um <laughs> Word. Right. Well, well my friend, let me let me pull it up now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah there was a duo, you know. They was doing their thing. Yeah. And, you know, they had a buzz in the town, in Atlanta, and just, you know, around the world. But 
once Teddy Boy, I guess, left the group and became two chains, because he always was T Boy, and then you know, I guess he started getting into this new persona of two chains. You dig what I'm saying? Because I met him years ago, 2009 in Atlanta, when I was out there for a short while. And he still was Titty Boy, aka Two Chains, about to really morph into Two Chains. But that's like a whole different type of nigga. That's a whole different nigga. If you a whole different rapper. You know well, what I'm saying? I wouldn't say a whole different rapper. He just started doing. I mean, he's doing a solo thing. Dollar wasn't spitting behind him. You know, he yeah. always his, how his flow is has always been the same. But he just got out. You know, he just got more into saying his name more. You know. And really, and he's trying to add more lyricism into his things subtly, you know. Facts, facts. facts. But you Don't witness that. Boy. You you witness that though. That's that, that that's the ill part. You. I remember. That. I remember having a conversation with Two Chains, man, where he uh -huh. we was at a um um at the spot next to one of my um wholesalers on the south side, and he was like, you know what, Jerry, man. Don't get me better. I'm great. Mm. I remember this. This we were next door hanging out. He was just like, man, you know, this is like when he kind of he was going on to a solo thing, but he it, it nothing was established, and he was just like looking like, man, I gotta get up, do something else. Wow, whatever that might have been at that time, which wow. might not have been a doing that. So hold on, let me let me stop you there. You remember the time when Titty Boy, aka Two Chains, was about to hang it up and do something else. Yeah, he was about to quit rap because yeah. he felt like it wasn't really working. It wasn't moving. Yeah, it wasn't moving enough. Mm. Do, like, do you remember that year? Oh man, that that had to be maybe oh five. That had to be like after Unk or something. Oh five or seven. Wow, or something like I just remember he was. I remember him really sitting there like, man, it ain't moving. Mm. Not like I wanted to. Wow, that, that's crazy. And it wasn't me that gave him words of wisdom, but I did, you know, I was basically still like, man, you still gotta, you gotta stay at it. You gotta grind, man. You gotta grind through it. And just like I can remember a time too when I was chopping up with um, Pitbull when Khaled first dropped and we was hanging at the strip club, Pitbull was like, Jelly man, I." I got to get on Black Radar. I got to get on Black Radar. I said, look, bro, you need your people. You need to be on. You need to be with your Spanish folks. I told him that straight off the rip. Oh, mm. Black Radio. I think Black Radio. For you. You gave him a gym. You gave him a gym. Bro. Yeah, I, I was like, for you? Man, we, was, we was chilling. This was this was during that kind of that period. He was like, man, I, I'm Black Radio. You don't need it. Said, you don't need it. Mm. Straight up. You need to be and, with two people. And, and how long after that he became Pitbull, the international superstar? How about six, six, how about six years later? Wow. Yeah. I know wow. that's the early 2000s. Yeah. And, and I know that made you feel good seeing him. Oh, man. To this day. And I'm pretty sure other people told him that. But um, mm -hmm. you know, definitely just being able to chop it up is, you know, yeah, definitely, man. That's that's dope. Yeah, those those two artists right there, seeing those moments, you know, face to face, you know, and seeing them flourish and just you know stuff like that makes me proud as a music fan. I I, I called myself a music fan before a DJ because I enjoy music. Mm -hmm. They really stuck to they you know stuff with they sell, and that's a blessing. Gotcha. You know, them, they blessed. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, I want to get into you as a DJ. Did you produce at any point in your life? Yes, in, yes, in terms of production from mental, you know, saying, hey, man, you need to put that kick, need to go there, this need to go there, or this need to be you sound like this. You co produce. Exactly. Gotcha. Exactly. 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 Yeah. Now, did you ever really wanted to get hands on with it, or you just was like, you know what, I'm gonna stick with this DJ thing because I'm, I'm I mastering this. I I really didn't want to dibble and dabble over here because 
You want but, to I'm not gonna lie, the drum machine and software like that bore me. You know, mm -hmm. the production, I did production with my mixtape. As a mixer, I do production. And that production influenced a lot of producers here in this city over the decade. Like you even asked Lil John. He was in he did an article for Vibe magazine saying, Yeah, man, I just get in the room and get my my blunt or whatever you're saying, I get my DJ jelly tape and I go to just create it. because how I how I mix is really producing. Wow. Jelly. I might take a biggie acapella, get an Al Green bass line, and I might get a Dr. Dre kick and snare and put it all together. I just give people the possibilities of what something can sound like when I mix. Mm. Facts. And being that you on brought up little John. Little John had a crazy wave. Man, Remember that wave? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's tell me, a, tell me about thought. that. Because you're from the town. You know, I'm from New York, so I couldn't really see it, but I felt it. But tell me, give me a visual of that little John wave, because he because he had it at one time. Like he had it on Smash. I mean, I mean he did. I mean, but you gotta think before that, before that, he was straight, straight reggae, straight New York, musically. You know what I'm saying? But he found his niche. I, he found it in the club scene. He, you know, he was little John Jack stuff. He was like a P. Diddy to me. In terms mm. of, is it a bad thing? No, but it is what it is. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. He found, he really stuck with it. Because I can remember towards like, um, how can I be down all those events, those DJ events that would be cracking in the in the late 90s, mm -hmm. Lil John be there with his records. He'd be trying to get people to listen to his music. And he really stayed down with wow. himself. He was another person. He was his own. You know, I never, you know, Lil, I never heard Lil John say, man, I'm not going to do this. He may have, but he was the kind of person that uh, just come and bum rush an event, like a DJ event. Mm. He used to be very persistent and was always on it. So, so when he was said bum rush, Explain that, well, right, bro. And then you know that whole thing with Jermaine when they start doing the social based arts, uh, mm -hmm. social based stuff in the mid '90s. You know he was a part of that production. He really he just stuck. He just stayed down with stuff, man. I respect that. And that when that wave finally hit, like ten years later, it was it was nonstop. Him and his crew, they would not stop with it. Facts. Now. And they right. and they really they really kicked off, like Outkast really put Atlanta into the stratosphere of hip hop. Lil John really, to me, from a production standpoint, mm -hmm. made it more mainstream in terms of the rap sound of Atlanta. Got you. He really they he was a juggernaut. Him and his crew, they production wise, sonically, they really changed and really put Atlanta on the map in terms of the sound. Mm. I'll catch it as artists, which is very important, first mm -hmm. of all. And that's, that's man, Lil John came with that wave, he just broke it all the way, all the way. It was almost how Master P did um, New Orleans. At that, at yes, sir. You know, he just yes, sir. Broke, it, broke it up, broke yes, it away. Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned Jermaine Dupree. I mean, we're talking about ATL, so we got to mention Jermaine Dupri. Absolutely. Been in the game 30 years, maybe? Plus. Dang, 30 plus. Because he, he's been in there since he was a kid. He was right. dancing in the, um, what video he was dancing Houdini. in? In the Houdini, the Fresh Festival. Exactly. Video. Crazy. He was like nine years old or something like that, maybe? He was somewhere, man. <laughs> yeah. Jermaine Dupri been in this 30 years plus made monster records monster um, right. he's responsible for his career mm -hmm. the brat little bow wow uh what's the uh, rb group um, Chris Crow. Chris escape. escape exactly ragged edge mariah carey uh we keep going <laughs> yo we go on and on like i mean i hate to Put this title on him but he was like i guess the diddy of atlanta you know what i'm saying you know i mean he's his own man I mean, he was a, yeah he was a, 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 a you know a, a industry 
guru. I mean, based I mean, industry coming from the industry, he was, you know, he was more in that lane. Facts. Period. Facts. And he did his, and he, and he does his thing. I can't say he did. Nah, nah, he does his thing. Gotta give it to him. He got he, that he, money. He called himself the mayor of Atlanta. I respect that. Mm. You give him that title, mayor of Atlanta. I mean, from the, from his perspective. Mm. Gotcha. We talk about the industry now. If you want to talk about the street mayor of Atlanta, then you're gonna talk about Big Oom. Mm. Period. It is what it is. You know. What it I'm is saying? what it is. Um. Wow. Because um, with Jermaine Dupri, when he made that record, um, I mean, this is of course years later. He, you know, he put out so many records and so many artists. Welcome to Atlanta. And Atlanta was on fire at that time. And he got up all these big Atlanta artists on his record. And then it's like, it's almost as like, yeah, we got it right now. It's like, welcome to Atlanta. And, and everybody wanted to come to the town and, and witness the whole strip club. That was, a, that was the icing on the cake. At the t well, that was really, the, yeah, that was icing on the cake. Facts. Facts. Good, what was, perfect timing. What was going on at that time? Did you notice a lot of artists coming in from different regions just to, I guess, feel the vibe when that record was going on and everything that was going on? Uh, absolutely. I mean, the, the town was on fire. I mean, man, everybody was coming here. I mean, it was like we were right in the eye of the storm and, it, and, it, and everybody knew that we, we're here. We're here. We have a part of this hip hop part of this music facts we have it we have a part of this now we we molding it we creating it we got it and, and we're not going nowhere that was, no that, was really that type of record that made that statement it was like this is a wrap no doubt straight up this gonna be one of many interviews on mrec tv because you you family now salute the dj jelly appreciate you but i gotta ask you this you have before you go Give me, and, and you know, everybody top five changes, but for <clears> you, who's the top five rappers or MCs in Atlanta for you? Okay, I'm gonna say number one is Outkast and their duo. Mm -hmm. Period. They're my favorite duo in hip hop, period. And I can't gotcha. tell you what do because Jam Master J, so that makes them a trio. Anyway, but Outcast definitely number one. Number two for me would be um, the rapper we talked about, legendary Kilo Ali. Mm. Behind him would be Hitman Sammy Sam. Now, we talk about we talk about impact, influence, all that, live everything in one. Uh, um, so that's Sammy Sam. Another artist, I would say Gucci. Gucci Man. Mm. I, I really would put Gucci Man and Future kind of at a tie. I was gonna ask you about Future too. Absolutely. As far as impact. Um and then I would say, oh man. Baby D. Little young dude who mm. the, real big in the late 90s. Baby D. Yep, this is not, you know I said I'm missing up. Now around and out with that would be behind that would be Tip and Jeezy. Can I put Gucci and Future? Tip and Jeezy, just the impact. Just guys, you. you know, and then Luda would be following that. So they round out my like, you know, my top ten pretty much. Gotcha, gotcha. I was gonna say you might as well call it the top ten. Yeah. Gotcha. That's dope though. That's dope. Um I appreciate that. Um what you got going on currently you know we in this whole global pandemic thing what's going right. on with you right now well, currently we got we got the whole mixtape monster.com that you can go to and stream all my mixes from the early 90s to now mixtape monsters.com mp assault shouts out to dj monte who is also the producer for floor ride to get low and all that he so that's mm. part of the whole big um camp like our influence is incredible. Um, we got the USBs, the mixes on the USBs that's currently going on. Oh, 
I'm teaching a lot of online cl DJ classes because I used to do Scratch Academy here in Atlanta before they shut it down. So I'm oh, doing wow. stuff online, you know. Um, man, syndicated mix show in a couple of different markets, uh, Southeast region here, everywhere. What's the name uh, of the show? Um, Southern Style DJs. Southern yeah, style man. DJs. You know, blessing that would just keep me stuff moving. Keep yes, the music. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And also, give them your um Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, Twitter and Instagram is at the real DJ Jelly. T H E R E A L D J J E L L Y. And uh, Facebook Jelly Jam J E L L Y S J A M. And um, yeah, that's you know I don't forget what the TikTok is and all that. But anyway, <laughs> but you know they can definitely catch me there. Especially on Instagram. Salute. Appreciate you, good brother. What's up? What's up? This is DJ Jelly, ATL Icon, the stamp of approval. And right now, you're on M Rec, and we're doing it live. Peace, world. To promote your music or promote your business by placing an ad on M Rec TV, contact M Rec TV promo, M R E C K TV promo at gmail.com. Peace. Oh, yeah. Subscribe to M Rec TV, youtube.com. Slash MREC TV. I'm gone. MREC TV. It's got a music.